The Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. It's a return to the Richard and Judy Book Club for Helen Dunmore, as she tells us all about her latest ghostly tale, The Lie. It's an evocative and highly atmospheric book that puts the horrors of the First World War very much in the foreground. It does. The poetic and at times graphic glimpses into the past gave us plenty of questions to ask the author, Helen Dunmore. Tell us what titles you've enjoyed on the Richard and Judy Book Club. Find us on Facebook slash Richard and Judy Book Club. The Lies, obviously, uh, very timely, Helen, published on the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War. But um, your interest in war was already there, wasn't it? Uh, as in The Great Coat. So what aspects of war fascinate you the most? I think with the First World War, it is that feeling that it was a war which completely transformed our society. It transformed hundreds of thousands, millions of lives. And we are the products of that war. And I wanted to look at the aftershocks as they are shown through young men and young women who've come of age during that war. It's quite extraordinary how you get right into Daniel's head and you take us with you as he returns to Cornwall after these uh, indescribable experiences in the trenches. How did you build up on his character? Da Daniel was a character who came to me with overwhelming force right at the very beginning of my thoughts about this novel. In fact, I would say he was the starting point. So it was a question really of delving deep into, into him, into his thoughts, his feelings, his experiences at war and what these had done to him emotionally, physically, um, psychologically. He, it was almost as if he were standing in front of me saying, I have a story in me and I want you to tell that story. Now, because this is the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War, um, it's been a lot in the news, obviously. People have been discussing it uh, and uh, have various opinions about it. And the Education Secretary, Michael Gove, he's um, criticised productions such as Oh, What a Lovely War and Blackadder, which he feels satirise World War I as a great conspiracy by world leaders and generals, although it was mostly young, working-class men who were sacrificed while the leaders saved their lives. Of course, many officers were killed too, like Frederick in your book. Do you agree with people like Gove that the war was necessary to stop Germany crushing and dominating the rest of Europe? My purpose in writing The Lie was to discover the lives of the people who went through it, who were changed irrevocably by it and the enormous changes in society that also took place. I'm not a writer who wants to validate the views of any particular politician. In fact, this book is not about the high ups. It's not about the leaders. It's not about those who are directing events. It was about those who were taken from their small communities and went, first time they ever went abroad, went to France and fought in unimaginable circumstances. And it's my grandfather's generation. When I was growing up, everyone's grandfather, including mine, had been in the First World War. And maybe we didn't ask them enough, or maybe they couldn't talk about it. But now, after 100 years, we can talk and we can hear the views and we can hear the experiences of all those people who, I believe, have often been silent. Well, you've called your book The Lie, and at the beginning you quote Rudyard Kipling, If any question why we died, tell them because our fathers lied. But it's not just that, is it? What do you mean by the lie? There are several layers of, of, of lie in the book. That generational lie, that um, misleading of the younger generation by the older, is very important. The idea that war could be glorious, it could be quickly over, it could be clear-cut, um, and that it would not be the consuming, devastating thing it turned out to be. That's part of it. But also, there are other lies. Daniel, in the central character, tells a lie which seems quite unimportant to him. It was, it's a lie that flows from his experiences in the trenches and the lie grows bigger and bigger and bigger and more, more consuming. And the other, another t layer of lie in the book is the lies told by those, really the, the softening white lies told by those who have been in the trenches cannot communicate how these men died. I'm talking about the letters written home to, to, to describe the death 
of a serving soldier and the formulae that were used that made it sound perhaps far, it, they sanitized it really and it was done from the best of motives but it was not the truth about what was happening in the trenches. So there are probably even more layers of lie than I've, I realized at first when I was writing it because the question of what is the truth, what really happened, does drive the book and Daniel is on, he is on a quest really to, to, to discover within himself what, what truly happened and what has happened to him. The Lie by Helen Dunmore comes with so much more bonus content if you get your copy from WH Smith. Everything's up for discussion in the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. I think Helen Dunmore is an amazing writer, so sensitive, so atmospheric. I mean, she captures Cornwall in those days, <laughs> and it's poverty, <laughs> it's dire poverty, uh, very, very well. But most of all, she captures Daniel, who is this young man. What, he's only, I don't know, he's about 20, I think. And he comes back to Cornwall, which is where he lived, after, in 1920, after the end of the First World War, having, the most, having had the most appalling, appalling time in the trenches. Um, and having seen his best friend, his best friend since childhood, Frederick, mm. killed. I think the description of a young man and his feelings on coming back, and his mother's died while he's been away, he's mm. a complete orphan, he's penniless, he's got nothing... Um, of coming back to nothingness like that after these horrible experiences is just amazing. And the way he tries so hard to hang on to his sanity. Mm. Well, the thing is, you know that what she's writing, uh, in, in the main, in, in, in the, the part that you just described, is absolutely true. Mm. That these young men went out there, and almost uh, most of them didn't come back if they are out there for more than a year. Mm. But those that did were totally transformed, as you would be by the experience. Some of them were insane for the rest of their lives. Mm. Uh, some of them were utterly withdrawn for the rest of their lives. That, that would certainly be the case for my grandfather, mm. who spent two years in the trenches near Rouen um, and came back a totally changed young man and, and was never the same again. And she captures that and I think writes that with beautiful sympathy, you know, real elegance. And, and, and it's, it's a hard thing for a woman to write because it's, on the whole, it's men that go to war and it's men that come back. Ah, oh, no, I don't agree with you. I think that the kind of... Uh acknowledgement and the knowledge of the emotional damage concerned mm. is very much a female womanly concern. What I mean is getting inside his head. Yeah. No, she, 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 it is extraordinary. And, of course, she, she's very good at writing about ghosts. Mm. Frederick, um, Daniel's best friend, continues to haunt him uh, uh, from as soon as he returns back to Cornwall. Uh, he literally haunts him. He mm. appears to him every night in his sleep. And he appears to him... As he did when he died, he appears to him covered in mud mm. from the battlefield. Um, and so strong. She, she describes it so vividly, it's quite extraordinary. You can act, actually smell the mud. Mm. You know, you can smell the mud on this corpse. And in the end, poor Daniel, it traces his life, his childhood life. He was very poor. His mother was a cleaner for Frederick's uh, father. Mm. Frederick grew up in a rich family. They became very close friends, even though they were completely different. But he... He, he, as he kind of traces, as he goes forward and tries very, very hard to make a new life for himself after the war, he can't do it. Mm. It's just too much. Mm. And it's all very tragic and very horrible, but very, very beautifully written about. Couldn't agree more. And Helen also had a few more tips and hints to share about the craft of writing. Poetry is very important to me, and poetry was very, very important to a lot of young men setting off to war in the First World War. It's very interesting how many of them took some poems with them. Um, yes, it's the music of poetry, and it's the sense that through a poem you can sum up the vital experiences of life very, very quickly, and you can take them with you. I love it, but there are times when writing is tough, when something isn't going well, when you've got a problem to solve, whether it's a plot problem or a problem with a character, and then you, you really have to work your way through that. But what I have realised is that every piece of writing is a stepping stone. Even if in the end you're going to discard that, 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 that day's work, it's taking you somewhere else. 
I don't think any author knows why they are one. It was something that from my early childhood was driving me, um, making me making me want to work with language, want to tell stories, want to create things in, in the form of words. Well, thanks for all your thoughts on our collections. Uh, if there's something you want to say, then just check out the website. You can do it there. Richard and Judy dot whsmith.co.uk The best piece of advice that I would give to a wannabe writer is to write and to read. And it's really as boring and trite and simple and important as that. That is it. That is the only magic formula. Sit down and write. Don't even worry about it being bad because a lot of writing is rewriting. So getting it down and finishing the book is the most important thing. And then everything else comes later. Follow your heart. Just follow your heart. If you really want to do it, if you're real, it's not just about writing, it's about life. Just do what your heart tells you. If you want to be a writer, be a writer. I think the most important thing is that you're passionate about your subject matter because writing a book is like a marathon. So if you're not absolutely passionate about what you're writing about, if you don't believe entirely in what you're doing, you're never, never gonna make it to the finishing line. Knowing you've got to get something done by tomorrow or the following week or the following month forces you to work. And I think the very fact that you're forced to do it, adrenaline starts to pump through you and you see things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And so I like to write in a way that a journalist would in a sort of mood of controlled panic doesn't suit everybody, doesn't necessarily suit my publishers actually, uh, but it suits me. Stay with us for the next edition of the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast. I guarantee there'll be sex and violence. Sam is asleep. I could kill him now. His face is turned from me, it wouldn't be hard. Would he stir if I move, try and stop me? Or would he just be glad that this nightmare was over? I think I fancy a makeover, Richard. What do you reckon to a bit of a buzz cut on one side? Uh, yeah, that would be um, really, uh, really pretty. I could change the colour, I suppose. Maybe a subtle hint of bubblegum pink? Right, so you're going to shave off half your hair and dye the rest pink. And? Uh, well, and you'd carry it off with a plomb. Uh, I mean, your hair's always been one of your crowning glories. It's always exceptional. You do realise your left eye goes funny when you're not telling the truth, Richard. Well, I won't lie to you. There's plenty more in store for you on the website. Click over to richardandjudy.whsmith.co.uk.